Hello everybody, welcome to the first of what will be many video tutorials for how to mod That Which Sleeps. As you know, That Which Sleeps was designed to be a very mod-friendly game, not just from a code perspective, but also from the user interface. We want to make sure that anyone can make their own custom agents, custom old ones, custom mains, and most importantly, a custom world to play out that drama in. So, what we've done here is we've created a more up-to-date interface based on what you saw before. Instead of going with that modular sort of Visio approach, which I was comfortable with, but pretty much no one else was, we've created um, a drill-down, full-screen interface that can also be um, dragged like an iPad screen. So you'll pretty much have limitless real estate to deal with here instead of having things smashed together through hyperlinks. All right, let's begin taking a look at what we have in front of us. We have core mod scenarios assets. This is what you will see when you jump right into the editor. So core is all of the fundamental game settings at their base values. You don't want to go mess with that really unless you want to change your base game no matter what else you add onto the game. You really want to make a mod and mod is the next and probably most popular selection. Mods can create old ones, races, can change the settings, can add its own code in. Um, scenarios as how you build a world out. So once you've gone in, into your mod and you've made new old ones and new artifacts and new lost ancient cultures, you can populate a world with them through the scenario builder. And that's where you're going to make um, leaders of the world, champions, and the POIs. Also the map builder list inside there as well now. Assets is our sprite handler. So it's actually very difficult inside Unity to work with uh, mods. So we had to build a lot of technology that would let you bring in these disparate sprites that people are just handling from different formats and then make sure it's packaged properly so that we still have all the performance benefits. All right, let's go ahead and make a mod. What we're going to do over the course of the next couple of weeks before we release these tools to the backers is I'm going to go through starting from making a race. We're going to make that race, going to give it a different, uh, an ancient lore, culture, its own items, its own heroes, and drop those into a world. Uh, for the first video, we're going to make the race itself, and we're going to look at traits. All right, so here's mods. You just see some mods in front of you. Like I was saying, this is a drag. Uh, you can drag this entire screen. It's all scrollable. So if there was a 30 mods, you could just scroll through them. If it populates more than the screen, a search button appears at the top that will let you search either by type, version number, can be published, uh, or name. So green check mark says this thing is ready to go. Otherwise, these other guys have uh, unfinished elements. For instance, if you start making a race and you don't give it a culture, you can't actually compile that mod because that's it. That's uh, invalid. A race must have a culture to exist, at least one. Okay, so let's make our own mod. And new mod, that sounds perfectly fine. New mod. This is a new mod for the video. And you'll see at the bottom left, so we do a drill down approach like I was saying. So main's always there to go back, of course. But below new mod, all the way at the bottom, you see options. The more you drill down into things, the more that's going to create a, a trail of breadcrumbs that you can jump back to any point. If you're not familiar with that terminology, don't worry about it. You'll see it going forward, and it's actually extremely convenient to use. To the right, you see 0 of 11 mods loaded. If you click on that, you can load other mods, creating a dependency on your mod for that mod. So that's if someone makes an old one, you don't want to just change their mod, you want to just add something to it. So you want to add to that guy's old one a few custom agents that work, that maybe a new spell or ritual. You can create that as a dependency. It will have that dependency for that version. So if someone else tries to load up your mod, they don't have that guy's mod, it will create it, it'll tell them, of course, that it can't run. If they have a different version, it will say you can try and run this, but it may or may not work. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, obviously. Like I said, this is going to take many videos to go through. Let's start at the fundamentals, which is how does the AI work. To understand that, we need to go to traits. So traits by itself is not, like I said, here's a scrollable screen. Um, traits by itself is not, uh, is not what drives AI, but it's driven from it and then can also override it, especially from personality elements. Um, so looking at what we have here, let's just click on the top guy, coward. Coward showing more than the proper amount of discretion. So there's a short description, and you can put a quote. Quotes are only shown if displayed, if, if written in. We don't tend to put quotes on traits because there's so many of them. Uh, tags, the tags are pretty important. Tags by themselves have no functionality. You can tag as much as you'd like with anything you like. Creating a new tag is very simple, and you can use that to organize um, your logic. So you see here personality and disorder. Personality tells you that it's driven off of the personality values. 
disorder tells you that this is considered to be a bad thing, and other heroes can perhaps try and work the person through their issues and remove this thing. Um, on the right side, this is more important, you see the actual effects and requirements. So for personality, requirements will always be what you see up the top. Minus three cautious. What is that saying is three or less on the cautious table. So the personality tables, there's six of them, and they go from negative ten to ten. They are not bad to good, they're simply different. So cautious on one end, bold on the other. This person so has to be at least three on the cautious scale. So if they're three or higher, and the higher it is, they have a chance of developing coward as a personality trait. Uh, what does it do? It drops the coward flag. So it's showing this isn't a numerical modifier somewhere. This is actually flagging something in the AI to say, oh, check first, is this person a coward? Oh, they are a coward, do the cowardly action. So a lot of personalities are like that because they're so specific. Um, let's take a look at a few of them so we can go through how they are different. You see a lot of personalities. We have, I think they have the most, probably like 40 or 50 all throughout. Physical, mental, we should see spiritual somewhere in there as well. These are social. These are the base traits that people sort of draw from. Think of it like a different decks of cards. So when a hero spawns, if he's, let's say, a dwarf hero, I think dwarves draw three physical um, traits. So they would draw from the list of, I think we have 15 or 20 physical ones, and they would get three of those at random, which further defines their character. Some might get mental, some might get social, and they can also get these as they level up. So um, after that, you can see we have bloodline listed there. We also have the races themselves. So a dwarf would also draw from the dwarf deck of uh, traits. If you added one in here that was a dwarf trait, your dwarves might start getting that. You can also tell them to take specific traits as well if you want to get more specific about it. Um, we see Freak, which is one of the interesting ones. Uh, there's pretty arbitrary tags, as you'll see, but uh, all the ones in the core are referenced in some way, shape, or form. Freak, for instance, is referenced uh, in aberrant bloodline births, but is also important for the Cult of Mirth, which is sort of an old one that didn't get into the game. All right, so let's look at one that has a new, more numerical value. Exceptional strength, an admirable though brutish quality. Tag physical, so anyone who draws a physical trait at start may have this. Stats plus one strength. We're not going to jump into that right now, how to add and modify that. If you want to modify it very quick, click on it and change it to two or three. Um, but that's actually a very in-depth process because there's so many ways to hook into the game. So you can set things like on new enemy enters combat, on enemy down, on enemy drained. You can have things like on enter POI, on leave POI. We have a process that goes through our code to find any event handler and then presents that as somewhere where you can plug in your modifier or your custom code to. We'll go through that with skills because it's going to take an entire video. But this is traits in a nutshell. So let's jump back. We'll click on the breadcrumb. So you see how this is options and traits here. We'll click on options. We'll go back to the options window. Uh, let's create a race very quickly. Race, major or minor. Minor races are the relatively irrelevant races like kobolds or something they can't actually build up and be a world power but you might see them as elite units as dangers and possibly as modifiers to a poi so let's make a major race let's jump into dwarves because the easiest way is to copy so we'll copy those guys and we'll name them the dwargs so these are going to be our guys going forward up oh, single and plural this icon up in the upper left says, hey, you've made a change you haven't saved yet, so don't crit or you'll lose that. Elder Race, Underground. It's important when you look at the race screen to keep in mind this is only the inherent elements of the race. Much of the race as it exists in the world is defined by its culture and its government. Government drives actions, culture drives sort of the personality and the way in which they act. You know, there's nothing about cruelty here, there's nothing about uh, their army types and such. Those come from further down, but this is the fundamental point to create a race. Um, so let's look on the right. Juvenile, elderly, mature, ancient. This is how they are born and how they age. These generally have negative statistics, although it's different for dwarves. But uh, important is between juvenile and mature, you see education. That means every this interval between juvenile and mature, you get a training event. So the parent is, how do I train this child? Um, it's important for the AI because it lets them develop people that are more skilled or specialized. It's important for you because if you can interfere there, you can generally corrupt someone that's rising to power. Uh, so with 10, they would do it three times before that dwarf reaches maturity. If I made that, for instance, 5, I would double that, 
which is great. Birth rate, 2, so only 2%, very low. Uh, they start at level 3. A lot of the elder races start higher than the lesser races. Experience modifier, they level more slowly. Sort of a typical balancing thing. Racial unity, 10. That's very strong. This is the value that says, I don't care what your culture is. I still, you're another dwarf, we're brothers. Or in this case, dwarves. The dwarves are very, um, very brotherly. You want to set this lower if you want more infighting between this race. Setting it higher means this race is much more likely to ally and join together. Racial unity of 10 is very, very high. It means if a dwarf thinks the old one is rising, he tells another dwarf that dwarf is probably going to believe him no matter what other differences they may have. All right, they have base stats for their arcana and investigation and health, will, attack, defense. Not only do those affect the heroes that spawn from dwarves, it also will affect the... Um, their units so not elite units but their base units will have their attack defense health will derive from this and um, even the small difference here is gigantic when it comes to large armies if you don't have elite units it's just this base value one stat higher so a dwarf's defense being three versus a human's two actually I think a human is one is massive um, lower right this is important so you see discipline, creative, cautious, bold, trusting, cunning. These are the personality traits. Um, these are not the traits, sorry. These are the personalities that drive the AI's decision-making process. This is not how the AI decides what he wants to do. Those come from desires which are driven by society. These are how they go about doing it and how they react to things. So uh, creative discipline. Do you see it's not one is good, one's bad. It's good to be disciplined. It's good to be creative. There's a trade-off there. Um, cautious and bold, same thing. Trusting and cunning, devious, honorable. Uh, one of the different ones is matriarchal, patriarchal. That's in there just because some societies can have a big, bigger spawn rate for a certain gender, and it also affects who gets control. You can actually override that as well in culture, and you can set certain positions such as generals and advisors to be a specific gender. Um, important here is the value goes negative 10 to 10, but we aren't representing human society so negative seven to seven is sort of what you would expect from a human a rational human society even a fanatic human society would be around a seven setting the numbers higher than that is sort of the fantastic representation of that so honorable being at six is very high um but if honorable was at 10 you would essentially have a race that is honor bound to anything they say no matter what so if you had a race that was 10 honor and they made a pledge with your agent that they'd help him even if they then found out you were the old one coming to destroy the world, they would still help you. Because that's it's meant to be a fantastic representation of personality. So don't set it too high unless you want that. These values vary for the societies inside of them, as well as the heroes. Commoners vary more than noblemen. Uh, and also variance, which you see at the bottom, affects how much it can vary. One is a very low rating, and um, but it does move... It, represent, it uh, pulls much further towards zero than it does away. So if you have, for instance, there's six honorable, you might see all the way down to one and zero for honorable for dwarves, but you probably only go up to a seven and very rarely an eight. So it's much easier to go back towards that neutral point. Looking at the center, you see the, the card draws we were talking about. So physical three, dwarf one, and then there's a specific trait that comes out to dust. So every dwarf will have to dust. To dust is uh, what alters how they grow in age. Dwarves return to being stone as they get older, so they'll, they get they get stronger, but they get slower, and they also their mindset changes. They become much closer to the earth, and they also become much more stubborn and less willing to listen to others. You'll have an easier time corrupting younger dwarves than you will older dwarves. So they get three physical traits. They get one dwarf trait. It's very easy to add and modify that stuff. To the left, you see the shield shape. That's not representing what shields they're going to get. It's what shield shape they use. We try to differentiate it by race, but it also differentiates further by government type. Uh, and also the default portrait to use. This is not where you select all their portraits and all their shields. That's done outside of this back at the asset editor. Now that we've created dwarves, 